If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me, please, to Galatians chapter 3. We're looking at a two-part, uh, two sermons on this text, so I'm going to divide it up in light of our communion service this morning. We're going to be looking particularly at uh, verses 6 through 9 of chapter 3, Galatians 3, 6 to 9. Paul says, Even so Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, Preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the nations will be blessed in you. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. Will you join me in prayer? He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient nor did I turn back. Amen. Last week we started chapter 3. Um, in chapters 1 and 2, Paul was establishing his apostolic authority, his right to speak on behalf of God, because that was at the heart of what the false teachers were challenging. They were trying to undermine Paul in the eyes of the Galatians. So to start this letter, he had to start there and establish his right to be an apostle. He did that in chapters 1 and 2. Now we start 3 and 4, the next section in this letter. And Paul, in these chapters, is defending the doctrine of justification by faith alone over against the false teaching of the Judaizers that were teaching justification by works. In particular, you had to be circumcised. You had to obey the Mosaic law in order to be right with God and to get saved. Now, to defend this doctrine, Paul takes two approaches. And we saw the first approach last week in the first five verses where basically Paul appealed to the Galatians' own experience with God, their experience with Jesus Christ himself, their experience with the Holy Spirit, their experience with God the Father. And he encouraged the Galatians in those first five verses to just reflect back, and we did the same. Think about Jesus Christ as publicly portrayed on the cross in front of your very eyes, in front of my eyes, and ask myself, why did that happen? And what does that mean in terms of my justification before God? Think about my experience with the Holy Spirit, the transforming power of God in my life when I came to Him and so forth. That was Paul's argument. Well, this morning he's continuing his desire to defend justification by faith, but now, instead of appealing to their experience, he's going to begin to make his case directly from the Bible. He's going to defend this doctrine from Scripture. Now, at this point, this time in Paul's writing, we need to remember that all he had was the Old Testament. That's all that was available to Paul at the time he's writing here. And... Paul is going to defend justification by faith alone from the Old Testament. Now, why is that important? Well, for two reasons. First of all, it tells us that justification by faith was taught in the Old Testament. A lot of people don't understand that or don't believe that. They think some kind of work salvation was taught in the Old Testament, and it's the New Testament that you know, had a different way of salvation, a different plan. But secondly, it also shows us how people were saved in the Old Testament. And they were saved by faith, the same way we are. They had to believe what God had revealed to them at the time. Now, the Judaizers, 
were teaching these Gentiles that they had to first become Jews before they could be saved. And they would build their whole way of thinking, their whole system, their whole theology on the Old Testament by twisting it and making it say something it didn't say. And so in our passage this morning, Paul is going to use that same Old Testament to refute them. And he's going to do it in two ways. We're going to look at way number one this morning in verses, uh, the, the passage really goes through verse 14. But he's going to do it in two ways. First, he's going to use the example of Abraham to show us what faith can do. And he does that in verses 6 to 9. That's what we're looking at today. And then next week, he's going to show us what works or trying to get to heaven by keeping the law, can't do. And that's what we'll see next week. So, that's how the text breaks down. So this morning, we're looking at what faith can do, and that's in verses 6 to 9. Look at it with me. Even so, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the nations shall be blessed in you. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. Now, Paul begins his defense, his argument, by referring to Abraham. And this was quite a blow to the Judaizers. See, the Judaizers wanted to refer to Abraham themselves as their father. They wanted to use him to teach that circumcision was necessary for salvation. So Paul is going to refute the Judaizers by referring to the very one whom they would build their whole theology and their whole position around. The Judaizers would reason like this. They would say, listen, God told Abraham that through him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. That was Genesis chapter 12. And then later on, God commanded Abraham and his descendants to be circumcised as a sign of God's covenant, as a constant illustration of the need for spiritual cleansing from sin. That was Genesis 17. So you have the promise to Abraham that through him all the nations would be blessed, Genesis 12. Then you have this command to be circumcised in Genesis 17. The Judaizers would take those two accounts and put them together and they would conclude that if the rest of the world, namely us, the Gentiles, were to share in the promised blessings to Abraham, then the first step is to take on the sign that marked God's people. And that sign was circumcision. Okay, that's how their thought process, their logic would go. But notice how Paul responds to that kind of thinking in verse 6. Here he's quoting Genesis 15 and verse 6. And he says, even so Abraham what? believed God, believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Paul says to the Galatians, the reasoning of the Judaizers doesn't work. It doesn't follow. Why? Because God pronounced Abraham as righteous based on what? His belief. His belief in God, not because he was circumcised. As a matter of fact, God's command to Abraham to be circumcised didn't come until many years later. After God had already reckoned him as righteous. Abraham wasn't circumcised until 14 years after God had already declared him to be justified, to be righteous. That's Paul's point in verse 6. 
You can't say, Judaizers, that Abraham was made right with God by being circumcised because he wasn't circumcised until 14 years later after God had already declared him justified or righteous in Genesis 15. Now, the other thing the Judaizers were saying was that you had to keep the Mosaic law in order to stay right with God, in order to be saved or to be right and stay right with God. But there's a problem with the timeline here too, isn't there? <clears throat> the problem is that Moses in the law came way after Abraham lived, right? The law wasn't given during Abraham's lifetime. And so the question becomes, how were people before Moses and before the law, how were they saved? And the answer is the same way he saved Abraham and the same way he saved everyone else since then, and that is by faith, by believing his word and what God had said. So you see what Paul's doing here. He's saying that Abraham is the supreme example that salvation is spiritual. It's internal. It's by faith alone. And Paul uses the very person whom the Judaizers would look to in order to prove them wrong. See, the Judaizers do what people can do today. Some whole denominations do it uh, with some of our rituals today, like infant baptism. The, 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 the Judaizers, like most of the Jews of Jesus' day, had completely reversed the relationship of circumcision and salvation. Circumcision was only a mark. It wasn't the means of salvation. Circumcision was a physical sign that was to identify the people and separate them from the pagan practices and people and nations that surrounded them. It had no effect in terms of someone's justification before God. And it can be the same with something like, say, infant baptism. There are denominations, I grew up in one, that teach baptismal regeneration. That when an infant is baptized, they're saved right then. They receive the Holy Spirit right then. Well, they might, but they, they may not. I didn't. I didn't become a Christian until my freshman year in college, and I went back to my pastor in that church and tried to talk to him about it, and while he didn't deny that I'd had an experience, a spiritual experience, he questioned me saying I just became a Christian. He said, what were you all those years before? You know, you had an experience. You'll have lots of experiences. That can happen today. Abraham, the point is, was justified 14 years before he was circumcised. And so the Judaizers can't be right in using Abraham to build their case that you had to be circumcised before you could be saved. In addition, Moses in the law didn't come until after Abraham had been long gone. And yet Abraham was right with God without the law, see? And so on both fronts, the, exa the example of Abraham refutes what the Judaizers were teaching. Now, Paul carries it a step further in verse 7. And here he tells us how we, how Gentiles, the rest of the world, uh, can get in on the blessing promised to Abraham and his descendants. Notice what he says in verse 7. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. See, another thing the Judaizers were, were, were claiming was this certain heritage that they could trace back to Abraham. They were claiming him as their father. They were basing their whole theological system off of him. 
and the Mosaic law. And Paul basically says, listen, only genuine believers, those who are of faith, have any claim to a spiritual relationship to Abraham. In other words, Jews with no faith are not true sons of Abraham. Whereas Gentiles who believe are. By believing, we share in the blessing of Abraham. Now, Paul goes on. He says in verses 8 and 9, And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. And here Paul's quoting Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3. And he says that the blessing promised to Abraham would come to all the nations, Jew and Gentile, by faith. By faith. Now, what was the blessing promised to Abraham? Well, it was to be justified to be right with God, to be put in God's favor, eternal life, to be received into fellowship with God Himself. It was the promise of the Holy Spirit to be regenerated and indwelt by God. That was the blessing of Abraham. And the means by which the blessing would be inherited is faith. It's faith. And so both verse 7 and verse 9 affirm that the true children of Abraham are not his posterity by physical descent, the Jews, but rather his spiritual progeny. See, people like you and me who share his faith, namely Christian believers. And all of this Paul says the Galatians should have known. They should have never fallen under the spell or the word he uses in verse 1. They should have never been bewitched by these false teachers. Paul says to them, if you had kept Christ as publicly portrayed before your very eyes as crucified, if you had reflected on what the Old Testament actually taught, then you would have seen that the teaching of the Judaizers contradicted the gospel of justification by faith alone. And so Paul begins by showing us what faith can do. And what can faith do? It can make you right with God. It can justify you before Him. Well, we come to the Lord's table now. And here we have a picture of justification. We have a picture uh, of the one who justified us, the one who hung on the cross. This is uh, what Paul talks about in Galatians. Christ is publicly portrayed as crucified before your very eyes.